But we're going to keep going with this uh, Jesus Friend of Sinner series that we've been in. Uh, for those who have been here, basically what we're talking about is some of the challenges and the things that uh, kind of sometimes come between Christians and the church and the world as far as betraying the message and doing our goal and fulfilling our mission of going out and leading people to the Lord, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and then teaching each other uh, discipleship to uh, become more Christ-like, to obey everything Christ has commanded of us so that we have freedom instead of uh, some of the challenges that, that uh, come into our lives. doesn't mean everything's perfect, but there's a freedom there, and we're going to talk about that some more today. And we have covered several different areas uh, as far as the first week, the, the challenge of bringing 100% love and 100% truth to every conversation. That, that, that what happens when we just bring too much love and not enough truth, or too much truth and not enough love, people get hurt. People get pushed away. That's where we find a lot of people have been kind of... Uh, hurt by, by Christians or church before. So we talked about that. Then we moved into how we see things. The first week was how we see other people, make sure we don't label people or see them from mistakes they made or challenges they're going through or the culture they come out of. Next week, how we see ourselves, not labeling ourselves. The next week after that was how we see Jesus. That was last week. And whether or not we treat him like the, the naughty kid in the lunchroom that we're afraid everybody's going to find out we're friends with him. That's kind of been the repeating phrase that comes out of that. And today we're going to take a look at another thing that we look at. How, how do we see our own personal lives? How, not, not just how we see ourselves, but our own personal lives, the things that we go through. Because generally, if we have a lot of struggle, if we have a lot of stress, if we have a lot of things going on that's kind of holding us down, being a reflector of joy and light isn't exactly the easiest thing to pull off, is it? When we get sucked into the things that the world has, and just like we were praying about, maybe the ripple effects from mistakes we made or the ripple effects of what other people have made, they, they, all that gets sucked right out of the vacuum, and it's a lot harder to be the reflector of light in the world when we, when we see things from that standpoint. And I'm telling you, I'm convinced of this. Uh, I'm sorry, Dulce, I didn't bring your tissues. Uh, some, some people requested tissues today, and I forgot. They're, they're back here on the back table. You bought your own? There's big old, like, walls of toilet paper in the bathroom if you're going to need it today. A couple people are asking me, just grab them, take them. Um, but I want to dig into this because I'm convinced that there's some walls already being torn down. Some of the conversations I've had over the last two weeks, and I don't mean like one, I don't mean two, I don't mean three, I mean several conversations I'm having with people. That God is saying, you know what, those walls have been around you for years, for decades, maybe your entire life, and it's time for them to come down. I see people just right on the verge of breakthrough. I see people right up to the line of freedom. That if they make some new choices and they open up some new doors and they let go of some old hoods, I'm telling you, there's some new things right on the horizon. Doesn't mean the circumstances change, but I'm telling you, the joy can. Doesn't mean that, that everything just gets fixed tomorrow, but your peace can be there. That peace that passes all understanding. Remember, that last part is, what, what is the trigger. It doesn't make sense, but you got it anyways, and you can look and go, ha ha! Right? I'm telling you, a lot of you guys are right on the edge of that. And well, I just want to hit it hard today. I just want to knock out the ballpark to take you as close to the water's edge, and then after that, it's up to you. Sound good? Are you guys in for that? So we're going to go straight to the Scripture. So go ahead and grab out the Bibles. Go grab out paper, pens, journals, iPads, or iPhones, Jude version, whatever you want to use. But we're going to have some notes. We're going to dig into it. But we're going to first, uh, Second Corinthians. We're going to continue right where we've been. Paul seems to know what he's talking about, so I'm not going to get in the way of that. Second Corinthians chapter 6 is where we're going to be, and we're going to talk about these things. Now, the first part of our message or our study is going to generally be about the hardships of life. I don't want to spend a lot of time here because if you're in the boat of the, that I'm talking to today, and if you're not, good for you, it'll come sooner or later. But for those who are right there, you don't need to, me to talk a lot about hoods because you already got them, right? <laughs> you're already on them. But I want to show you that Paul understands what we're talking about by rehitting some things we hit a couple weeks ago. And then go deeper into them about what God has to say to us today when we're in those places. So here's the first thing that we have to go to. And we have to decide right off the bat whether or not we believe the scripture. That's going to be the first thing that you have to decide. Whether or not you believe the word of God is the word of God and it is true. Whether or not you have emotions into it or not. That's the question. Do you believe the scripture is the scripture? That God is true and God fulfills promises. That, what's that? that? Amen. Okay. We're in? Okay. Look at this very first verse. Or the second verse. Verse 2. I tell you, this is what Paul says, now is the time of God's favor, now is the day of salvation, I tell you it's here. Do you believe that? You might not be feeling it today because of stuff that you've been dealing with, but we have to decide whether or not we believe the scripture. And Paul's saying, his day of salvation's here. 
It's the church age. We've been in it for 2,000 years. His salvation is here. His glory is here. You are his child. You are grafted into his family. His adoption is pure. It is completely paid for with his blood. It's there. Today is the day of salvation. Do you feel it is the second question. Because sometimes we don't, sometimes we do. Sometimes we come to something like this and just kind of like, oh yeah, that's true, yeah, woohoo. But the last week you're just like, right? Some of us don't have enough love to do that. Some of us are the red-headed twin sisters, so I'm not going to bring up. Okay. I'm sorry. See, I don't point them out, but they look at each other and he's like, oh, it must be them. Okay. You guys call yourself out. But if we believe it, then we have to deal with this and get this other junk out of the way. This other lies that Satan's been throwing on us out of the way. And Paul knows what we're talking about. Again, we're going to read through verse 3. We're going to verse 10. We're going to break it apart a little bit. Not a ton of time. And we read this a couple weeks ago. But, but look where Paul's coming from. The guy that says this talks about pain. He says, We put no stumbling block in anyone's path so that our ministry will not be discredited. Rather, as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way. Look at all the ways he talks about. In great endurance, in troubles, hardships, distresses, Beatings, imprisonments, riots, and hard work, sleepless nights, hunger, and purity, understanding, patience, and kindness, in the Holy Spirit, and sincere love, and truthful speech, and in the power of God, with weapons of righteousness in the right hand and in the left, through glory and dishonor, bad report and good report, genuine yet regarded as impostors, known yet regarded as unknown, dying and yet we live on, beaten and yet we uh, not killed, Sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. Poor, yet all, making many rich. Having nothing, and yet possessing everything. If we look at this, and we start breaking it out by category, it's pretty easy to find ourselves in this paragraph. If we start breaking them out, just going back up to verse 4, the second half. And great endurance, and troubles, and hardships, and distresses. That's just pretty much life, isn't it? I mean, that's just life issues. I mean, for some of us, depending on the season of life that you're in, that just sounds like, oh, that's a day. That sounds like a Monday and the sequel Tuesday, right? I mean, that's just, that, that sounds like life. And for some of us, we're in that season. Some of us, we feel like we've been in that season for years. And for some of us, we have. It's not what God wants us to be. Look at this next part. In beatings, imprisonments, and riots. Now he's talking about stuff that's not just life, but things that people do to you. He didn't call it a riot. You know, I, I said this was last week or two weeks. Have you, I've never been in Waldo. Eating at the GNR, when the entire town shows up, grabs me, drags me in the streets, and tries to beat the living crap out of me until I'm dead. I've never had that. But that's what Paul went through, according to the scripture. But I have had other people impose their will on me. I've had, had other people judge me, or take and say I said something that I didn't say, or imply that I meant something that I never meant. I've had people stab me in the back. I've had people that were close, close friends walk away from me. Am I the only one in the house? Right? The other people do things outside of our will, by their free will, that hurt us. And Paul says, I get that. We continue in hard work, sleepless nights, hunger. That sounds to me like stress. Have you ever been there? Because I've had stress, and that sounds about right. Hungry, sleepless nights, the things that just stress us out in life, not being able to pay the bills, not being able to get where we think we're supposed to be. Life's not looking the way we thought it was going to be. Different stressors that are there. Even from there, you go into purity, understanding, patience, and kindness. You know, sometimes it can just be hard and hurtful just trying to be godly. Just trying to show somebody some kindness can be a, a stressor right there. I don't want to give them kindness. That's right. God says I have to give them kindness. Yeah. That blows. Uh-huh. <laughs> right? We're all there. We've been through all this. Some of it, it can be hard just to be godly. In the Holy Spirit, in sincere love, and truthful speech. You can't read this without realizing he's talking about evangelism because we've been talking about this since the beginning. Being led by the Holy Spirit, bringing love, bringing 100% truth. You can take hits for that. People can mock you for that. People might not want to be your friend anymore. It could be a stress in your marriage. It could be a stress with your kids. It could be a stress in any environment that you could possibly put yourself in. If you're going to follow the Spirit, love and truth, there's stresses right there with Paul experienced. Look at this. Then gets into spiritual warfare. I love this. In the power of God with weapons of righteousness in the right hand and in the left. He's not talking about like casual, mad today kind of stinks, so Satan tries to catch me to lie, so I kind of stop him. He said, I got a sword in this hand, I got a dagger in this hand. And if you ever watched Braveheart or Lord of the Rings, you know what I'm talking about. Blocking with this hand, going with this hand. It's intense, the spiritual warfare that we deal with sometimes. The enemy is going to take that mistake that you made and try to flare it up. 
The enemy's going to take that tough situation that you have no control over, that you know is in God's hands, and say, but what happens if it all falls apart? It can't fall apart. My God's got this. Well, if I lose my job, what if my kid never talks to me again, what if my marriage falls apart? Put it in God's hands. It's okay. You're fighting a spiritual battle with one hand and the other. It gets intense. And he goes through and he starts breaking apart all these other things about how people see things or how our lives can be. Glory versus dishonor. Good report versus bad report. Genuine versus imposters. Known versus being unknown. Living on even though you feel like you're dying. Not being killed even though you're beaten. Rejoicing when you're also feeling sorrowful. Not, not being, but being poor but making others rich. Possessing everything even though you have nothing. I mean, he goes on, he goes, I get it. I get it. And if you're truly a child of God, living in this world, I'm telling you, that pretty much sums up life. Doesn't it? It almost feels like we're somewhat schizophrenic, living between these two, because the world tells me this, and my God tells me this, and I'm trying to figure it all out when I'm in the middle. Anybody struggling besides me in the house? We're not alone. This is life. This is life. This is what the world wants to suck us into, and all God says, I'm your daddy and I've got you. That's what it comes down to. I don't know why it's so hard for me to get myself from here to here some days. I don't know why it's so hard to take that face up and say, I'm feeling all this, but I'm going to remember this. And some of you guys are doing that really, really well. It's just I can't shake the feeling of this. I know this, but the feeling... The feeling's just not matching up. We're all together on this, guys. It's because we're living in a tent. We're not home yet. This is the world. Some of this is caused because of things that has nothing to do with you. Maybe God's taking and leading you to perseverance, to maturity, to lean into Him. Maybe He's allowed that to happen to do that. Maybe it's because somebody else's free will and it wasn't God's plan at all. But somebody threw it on you. Oh, maybe, just maybe, you were dumb enough to make a mistake that put yourself over here. And my daddy says, come back over here. I've got this. There's going to be some ripple effects. But I'm going to come off of my throne and I'm going to walk with you. Remember we talked about this a few weeks ago. With my comfort, my compassion, my love, I'll come down off my throne. I will walk beside you and I will help you with great strength. we got some ripple effects now. But I'll go through it with you. He's constantly taking us over here, constantly dragging us back over here because this is what he has for you as his child. Everybody still with me? Okay. Go to verse 14. This is kind of a sidebar because we can go from right to that to the next thing, but this I think is important that we've got to hit. He's going to talk about probably one of the biggest things that knock us all over the place as far as the longest amount of time. Paul advises, do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what does righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what does fel or fellowship can light have with darkness? What harmony is there between Christ and Belial? What does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will live with them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. If you are under the age of 20, if you can get this today, you're going to save yourself so much pain. And there's a ton of people in here that will say amen to that. Amen. The earlier you can get this, okay, the earlier you get this, the less pain you're going to have. And not everybody's going, yep, he's going to talk about dating. I'm not talking about dating yet. I'm not even talking about marriage. I'm just talking about in life. When he says being yoked with something else, he's talking about, you know, those oxen, you get that big old yoke on the two of them, and they have to work together and move around together and all those type of things. When you partner with somebody... That's an unbeliever in anything. You're setting yourself up for some failure. And if you can know that before you do it, trust me. Okay? Now, it's one thing to be a bunch of oxen in a field. We're still called to be in the world. We're still called to be ambassadors. We're still called to be missionaries in the world. So we have relationships. But partnering, partnering is the issue that he's talking about. Because when I talk to somebody and they're saying, dude, I might be losing my job. I might lose my job because there's a lot of things happening in the job that's unethical. I've been uncomfortable with it for a long time. I went along with a couple of things, but this thing that's in front of me now, I just can't even do it. And if I don't do it, I'm going to take and lose my job, my finances, my family's going to be struggling. There's all kinds of challenges, and I don't know what to do. And if I could have talked to him two years ago when the first issue came up and said, 
put your resume out now. Don't get yoked with this company if it's unethical. Then they wouldn't be in a situation where everything's on the line, would they? That's what Paul's telling us. That's what he's trying to, 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 to share with us. Is, is there something along that sense? When you're at a party, okay, we'll go younger or older. I don't know. It depends on the circles you're running in. And you're struggling with that joint that's in front of you. Or you're struggling because someone pulled out some crack cocaine. And you're thinking, gosh, what do I do now? Everybody's looking at me. You wouldn't have to worry about it if you said, yes, mom and dad, I won't go to the party. But if you said, no, mom and dad, I'm not you know, going over to her house to spend the night like I told you I was. I went over here. We put ourselves in situations, and then they're tough, and then we we'll go, oh, gosh, how do I deal with this tough situation? Don't put yourself in the situation. The earlier you get it, the easier it is. Yeah, let's talk about dating. We have a lot of singles in our, our midst. I talk to a lot of people that are struggling, wishing that they had somebody, a partner in their lives. I get that. And I guarantee you if that's on your heart because God put it there and he's got somebody for you and he's worth the wait. Don't compromise. Don't compromise. Don't go for less. I have a ton of people, and I'm not talking about anybody in this room, so you don't take it personal. I'm talking a ton of people, and a couple of people in this room, who say to me, <laughs> everything's falling apart. You know, I, I, th I thought I could get her to be a Christian. I thought I could get him off the drinking. I thought that we could do this. I thought we could do this. Get all that stuff done before you say yes to the date and get yourself emotionally involved because it hurts too much. If we can get this early, the earlier you get it, the less pain that there is. Let's not joke ourselves with the things that are going to hurt us. If only I had a sign. You had five, right? I've been there. I've done it. And you make dumb mistakes, and then you bring it back over here, and you get it right, and you deal with the ripple effects as your God walks beside you, helping you with great strength. But let's break through the walls and stop doing those things that joke us to the things that are not Him. He wants more for you guys. He wants more for you. So, with that in mind, turn to Hebrews 10. I'm going to go out of 2 Corinthians and we're going to go to Hebrews 10. And if you've been around for a while, I don't know, probably about three years, we talked about this not long after uh, the elders got back from a Catalyst trip. Catalyst is a church leadership uh, conference down in Atlanta, Georgia that we go to. Uh, actually, I don't think we've actually made mentioned, but uh, three of us are going down the, the next month for this and be able to hear different speakers speak and be able to worship and more than anything else is just go there to have some time away to focus on God. And uh, we came back from that and this was part of the message that was on my heart for our church at that time. And as I was reading this, it was just God saying, do you remember Hebrews 10? Do you remember Hebrews 10? Do you remember Hebrews 10? I said, how can I forget it? It's the best halftime speech ever given. The best halftime speech ever given. And it's given by the author of Hebrews. Because in life, some of us are at a place that would be easily compared to football. And I don't know if you like football or not. You don't have to know a lot of details. I just found out yesterday I can't get a high state football game. <laughs> except for on ABC. But that's okay. I live. I play PlayStation 2. You don't care. Okay. So here's the thing. If you know enough about football, you know what it's like. And you might have seen it in the movie or whatnot. When the team comes out, and they're kind of, maybe they're underdog, maybe they're, they're doing great or whatever, but the first half goes really, really badly. You know what I'm talking about? They came out, they came out with all the vin vigor, and they're ready to go and stuff, and it just keeps going bad, and they're fumbling, and they're getting sacked, and they're not getting scores, and the other team's going up. Gets the end of the like, first half, is like 24 to 0, and they're coming in just feeling defeated, and they've got no energy left, and they come into halftime, it just feels like it's over. It's the job of who to come in and to change that? The coach, right? He comes in and he gives this halftime speech and sometimes the, you know, the memorable one, let's do this for the Gipper, whatever it is. And they come in and they kind of refocus that we are a team, the game is not over yet, and we need to pull this out. You guys have seen, you know what I'm talking about? The general feel? And the general feel that I have, just I was praying about the church and praying over uh, some of you guys this week, is that that's where some of us are at. We're at the end of that first half, everything seems to be falling apart. We have no energy left for the second half. We know we've got to go on. You know, we're not, we're not dead, but we're, we're pretty beaten, right? We're not completely there, but I'm kind of feeling like I'm dying here. And I think Paul takes and speaks in to that as a great coach who tells us and he focuses us on what really matters and what the truth is when he comes in and says, we can pull this together because the game's not done yet. So if you look at this first section, I'm not going to read all of this first section. Uh, I'm looking at Hebrews 10, 19, just to kind of get you in the same ballpark as me. But 19 to 25 
is an incredible talk that I'm just going to highlight. But if you're going through the struggle, I ask you, just put that in your notes, put that in your U version, email it to yourself, but go through this in depth at home and go into it with the Spirit leading you. But some of the things that he says as he's trying to do this halftime talk, he says, first off, we have confidence. We have confidence to enter the most holy of holies. We have confidence to come in and to speak to our God face to face. We have the almighty creator God, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the one that you and I have no business in and of ourselves even being able to address because of the sin in our lives, who gave his son to be able to die so we can accept Jesus as leader and forgiver in our lives. By acknowledging with our mouths that he's the Son of God, believing in our hearts he died and rose again, and make it him leader, him forgiver, giving our lives over to him. Because of that, we have a great confidence that we can come to our Abba Daddy Father. When life is just blowing, everything falls apart. Since we have a great confidence, let's dwell into him. That's the start of his speech. Let's dwell in. Let's dwell near to God, he says in verse 22. And then in verse 23, he says, let's hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess. Let's hold unswerving. And in other words, when it wants to run off the road, when it wants to not make that curve, when it wants to not go up that hill anymore, hold on an unswervingly ma manner. This hope that we profess. We say we're Christians. We say our God is God of all things. We say that he's got this. So let's hold on to that. Let's not let go of that. If I can hold on to that unswervingly, I can sleep a little better at night, can't you? I can take and say, you know, when that phone call's coming and I'm so stressed out that phone call, you know, whatever this phone call is, my daddy's got this. Let's hold on swervingly to the hope that we profess to. And then in verse 24, he starts talking about let's come together as a team. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. This is why I'm so passionate about community. Many reasons why I'm passionate about Christian community. Let's spur each other on. Let's spur each other on to its love. Let's spur each other on to its good deeds. You don't do that where you say, well, I can believe in Jesus. And I just like going golfing on Sundays. We do that when we come together, not just Sunday mornings, but home groups. When we get together throughout the week, when we have lunch together, when we have dinner together. When everything's falling apart and a brother or sister in Christ says, you know, let's get together and, and, and just have some coffee and talk it through. Can I beg you, don't say no, because it's what you need more than anything else. I just don't feel up to it. What do you feel up to? Going home and laying in bed and crying? How about getting together with somebody else? Let's spur each other on. Let's love on each other. Let's communicate into each other. Let us keep meeting together as some are in the habit of giving up on. Let's keep going. Let's not give up on this. Let's take and be together as a team. Let's come together and encourage one another. All the more so as the day is approaching. And brother, sister, the day is approaching. He says, let's come together. Let's hold on to this. Let's do it together. We're not done. The game is not over. Go to verse 32. Do you remember those early days after you received the light, when you stood your ground in great contests in the face of suffering? Sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. At other times, you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You sympathized with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. In other words, go back. Do you remember when you first started believing? I had a friend of mine that I'm not going to point out in any way, shape, or form who came to know Jesus as leader for giving their lives last week. And she's been pumped. First out of the week, I'm just getting emails like, this is so cool. You're right. Right? But as a good pastor boy, I say, now Satan's going to try to come in and get that. Satan's going to come in and he's going to give some challenge to that. Just want to let you know, I, I don't want anybody thrown. And she said, you know what? He's already tried and I still feel the joy. I said, do you remember those early days? What a testimony. Do you remember those early days? Here, they, they had it tough. They went up against persecution. You and I have some bills to deal with. They chose to stand by, side by side. They, I could have hidden the house, but I came out on the street and stood by you as the mob came in. That's what they had in the early days. Because don't forget what it was like in the first quarter when you came out pumped. Don't remember what it like to feel the ball for the first time and you knew that all the possibilities were right in front of you just because the other team is getting in some hits. Don't give up. Get excited about this. Let's go back out on the field. Verse 35 says, Do not throw away your confidence. Why? It will be richly rewarded. Huh. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what He has promised for just in a little while. In a very little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. But my righteous one will live by faith. If he shrinks back, I will not be pleased with him. Do you hear what he's saying? I know it's tough right now. I know it hurts. Don't forget what it's like. 
Don't forget what matters. Hold on, it's going to be greatly rewarded. More than anything else, your daddy is just over the hill. If you can look past all the muck and the mire and all the things going on around you, and you just look straight up on the horizon, you can see your Jesus walking your way. If you can hold on just a little bit longer and make new decisions to calm down the ripple effects so the waves aren't quite so high, I'm telling you, you're going to see him walking across that water straight to you. That's what's coming. 39. And this is when I get pumped. But we are not those who shrink back and are destroyed. We are of those who believe and are saved. One more time. We are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who believe and are saved. You couple this with Romans 8, when he tells us that we're more than conquerors, you have so much power walking out of this room, you won't even recognize yourself from this morning. We are not those who shrink back and are destroyed. We are more than conquerors in Jesus Christ. I'm sorry, you might not have heard me. We are not those who take and shrink back and are destroyed. We're more than conquerors in our daddy, Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? We are not those who shrink back and are destroyed. We are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? Tell me about it. Don't give up. Don't let Satan win this. It's okay if you walk out of here and some of this is waiting for you as soon as you get to the car because all of this you're walking out with. Chapter 11, verse 1. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. If you ever want to know what faith is, that's right there's the definition. Hebrews 11 is considered the faith chapter. Kind of like 1 Corinthians 13, you've heard it a billion weddings. It's the love chapter. This is the faith chapter. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. Did you know that Noah had a problem with alcohol? Did you know he was a drunk? Some of you guys maybe did. It's in there. It's in there. You're like, well, that's not what I heard in my Bible stories in Sunday school. I know. According to the scripture, he had an alcohol problem. Did you know that Abraham took a shortcut because God promised him to have a child and it wasn't happening in his time? So he slept with a servant girl to be able to have a child and thought, well, I'll just circumvent God and it will work out somehow. And it all fell apart and affected their life for years. Did you know we're all one decision for making a mistake that would cost us 10 years of our lives? That's how quick it goes. That's how quick it goes. Do you know that Moses was so broken at the, Mo at the burning bush that when God said, guess what, I get a, I'm going to use you the way that you always desire to be used, that Moses fought him at least six times, and at the end Moses said, please God, can't you just give it to somebody else? That's how broken he was. That's not humble. That's, I'm, I've got nothing left. Do you know that Rahab was a slut? She was a prostitute? She's listed in this Heroes of the Faith chapter. She wasn't even a Jew. She wasn't even one of God's chosen people. Do you know David? You guys all know he had an affair, right? In my view, he raped her. And I've had a lot of people really uncomfortable the way I said that. But when I'm sitting at the top of my roof, and I see a woman naked bathing on the other roof, and I say to my guards, go get that. I want that. That doesn't sound like an affair to me. That's not dinner in a movie. And whoops. In my opinion, he raped her. Do you see the mistakes they made? What are you carrying in here today? What did you, what, what did you do that was so messed up that God can't love you? What, what did you do that, that you just don't have the strength to go on anymore? He can't use you because you just you don't understand. I made such a mis big mistake. And if you knew what it was, you would judge me. These are all heroes of our faith. You with me? Same people, Noah saved mankind because one man continued to follow God. If he didn't still follow God, God wouldn't have seen anybody we looked across the earth, and you and I wouldn't be here today if Noah was not faithful. Abraham was the father of our faith, and he did get back on the right track, and God did use him, and God did bless that. He's the father of our faith. Moses is the one who led millions to the promised land out of bondage, and we use it over and over and over again in our own lives, going from exile to structure, but it also foreshadows Jesus Christ in every way. Rahab is considered a hero because she stood up, and when she could have died for it, stood up for the spies of the Lord and hid them and helped them to escape. And David, he's the one after God's own heart, according to who? God. You can be over here. He'll use you. We are not those who shrink back on are destroyed. We are more than conquerors. But it's got to be your choice. The world's going to try to stop you. God's going to try to help you. you got to decide which way you're going to go. And if you understood that first half of that video, and you understand brokenness and messed up and everything else, and you're not feeling the second half, 
then he wants to meet you here today saying, I'm your daddy. I love you. I've been there. I've been hurt too. Yes, the things that you did, it did hurt me. You know why? Because they hurt you and I love you. And I want better for you. And I'll meet you here today. I'll meet you here today. I will meet you here today and give you that freedom. But you don't understand, even if I make this choice, it's going to be hard. Yep. And you got a community that's around you that's ready to go. Just spur each other on. We can go back on the field and we can take it for the Lord. Because he's ready to give it to you. I'm going to pray. I'll make it somewhat just open-ended so you can keep praying with God if you want. We'll start some music. Casting crowns, of course. And if you need prayer, I'm going to be right up here and I'll pray with you. But this is a time that the Spirit, I think, wants to talk to you. I've been seeing it for the last two weeks. He's been preparing you to talk to you this morning. But trust me, if you do not know Jesus is leading and forgiving your life, you want him. If you're willing to give up your life so you can have something better, take it today. And if you haven't, please consider it. Let him speak to your heart. If you have and you just think it's still messy and you just want to come to him and say, Father, I need my coach right now. I need you to get me ready back for that field. Talk to him today about it. I'd never see anything in the scripture where God says, nah, I don't want to talk to you about this yet. You need to suffer more. Don't see it. Nah, you need to carry that guilt a little bit more. Never seen it. We are not those who shrink back and are destroyed. We are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ.